Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to New Life Church, whether you're here in person or joining us on Instagram, on Facebook, or if sometimes it's on YouTube as well. I'm Jimmy, the pastor here, if you don't know me, and I'm glad you're here. I'm glad for this beautiful sunshine in the morning. And like always, I like to start out with the discussion question. So my question this week is, what is your most valuable or most valued item? Now, I know we're in church. The answer is not Jesus or any, you know, I mean, that's obviously we just take, we, we're assuming that that is your most valued. But like a physical possession, like it could be a coffee mug, it could be. Chapstick? Yes. If Chapstick I is Shelly's most favorite. Most... <laughs> <laughs> with the roll. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
which would be the field and the treasure, and compare it to something spiritual. But what does this mean? You know, I, I think we all sort of thought about buried treasure. You've seen the movies and stuff. When I was a kid, I used to pretend that I was searching for buried treasure in my backyard, or I'd, I'd hide something and make a map of where, you know, how many paces you go this way, and then you go six paces this way, turn three quarters of a turn, and then go this way, and like think having this buried treasure. But, you know, it, it's confusing to me when you look at this verse, it's like, whoa, I don't get it really, you know, like, why would there, why would this guy come across a buried treasure in a field? And why would he hide it and go by it? It doesn't make any sense. And we have to take off our 2021 glasses and look at it from the perspective of the day. Back then, they didn't, they, the banking systems weren't the same. They didn't have safe deposit box where you could go and put, put your treasure or valuable stuff into it. You know, there was, wasn't like, you know, in a movie where you move the picture frame, you know, you move a picture on the wall and there's a safe inside the wall. It wasn't any of that kind of stuff. So they had to have some way to keep their valuable safe. And they didn't just keep it in the house because, you know, how kids get, you know, when I was a kid, whenever my mom tried to hide something, that's the stuff that I found. And, you know, Christmas time, I always knew what I was getting because I knew exactly where my mom hid stuff and I'd go and snoop. You know, so you don't keep it in the house where the kids can get it or where thieves come and they can break it. You know, I mean, there weren't the best security systems back then either. And so thieves could come in and look and find stuff. So what they did, especially because at that time in that area, there was, you know, wars that happened occasionally and whatever conquering country would come in, they'd take whatever they found. They'd take stuff and if there was a banking system, they'd grab whatever money and anything that was there. And so what do you do? What's the safest place to, to put it? Somewhere on either their property or somewhere, a secret location, they would dig and bury the, their valuables for safekeeping with a plan to come and return at a later date and dig it back up and have it so they could have it. But they weren't always able to return. Sometimes, like if they were taken off into exile, they might not have come back. Or maybe they died in the process and didn't tell anybody about where this treasure was. And over time, nobody knew anything about it. And it's not as crazy as you think when you think about the burying the treasure, because Jesus told the parable of the we're going to study some some are coming up about this parable of the talents, where this rich landowner gave certain amounts of money to some of his servants, and one servant took the money and buried it so that it would be safe. And Jesus wasn't happy about that because. He, or the landowner wasn't happy about that because he didn't do it and he didn't invest it. That's a whole other story that we're talking about soon. I promise. But back then, the laws were different about discovering those kind of riches. And one of the rabbinical laws said if a worker comes across such a treasure, it becomes the property of the master or the owner of the field. So this guy was in the field, came across this treasure. Obviously, it wasn't his field. It, which means he was probably on the field doing some work with somebody else. And he, Jesus doesn't say much about this guy, but he was probably in the field, found himself, recognized the value of the treasure. And he didn't decide to like hide it under his cloak and sneak it out, hoping nobody would, would notice. He wanted to make sure he had a legal claim to this treasure. When I was working construction, I had a, a boss name, you know, that we were working on this house and, you know, nobody lived there. It was his old house that he was fixing up for somebody who bought it and the guy was going to flip it, basically. And I was up in the attic because I had to do this, do some cutting of the, you know, cutting the walls and stuff. And I came across in this dark corner. There was nothing else in this whole place, but in this dark corner, I came across an old Victorian, uh, a Victrola. 
You know, one of those things that they put the records on, it has that like horn thing that picks up and, you know, amplifies the sound. Came across this thing, and I'm like, oh, this has got to be worth some money. And I showed it to my boss, and he's like, oh, okay. Then grabbed it and stuffed it in his truck. A few days later, I found out he, he sold it for 500 bucks. I'm like, should I at least get some lunch out of it or something? <laughs> you split this or something? You know, so I mean, I can kind of relate to this guy not wanting to basically get ripped off for his fine. And so what did he do? He looked around, he, you know, he found the trailer, dug it up to see what it was, looked around, Dug it, or you know, buried it back up, covered it with the dirt. Probably put some shrubs or you know some brush or something over it so that nobody would notice. And hurried off and sold everything he had so that he could buy this field. He was willing to give up everything. He recognized the value of the treasure, so he was willing to give up everything else he owned in order to get this treasure. Okay, so cool story, but what's that have to do with me, right? Well, stick with me, because we had another story, another parable that Jesus told. In verses 45 through 46, again, which means these two stories are related, they're linked together, because he said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Okay, so pearls. Back then, pearls were the most valuable item that you could get. Pearls were more valuable than silver or diamonds or gold. And if you don't know, pearls are found inside oysters. So they're in these oysters, and an irritant gets into the, that meaty part of the inside of the oyster called the mantle. And it gets in there, usually it's like a grain of sand or something, get in there, and it's an irritant. It starts driving this, this oyster nuts, and so it begin, the mantle begins to secrete a substance that basically the same substance as the shell of the oyster, and it forms around there, and it, something smooth that takes away the irritation, and it forms this pearl. And pearls are rare. Like, back then they didn't have pearl farms or anything, or oyster farms or anything like that, but pearls are rare. I, one of the things I learned this week was that only about one in a thousand oysters actually have any kind of a pearl, and most of those are pretty flawed and not worth a whole lot of money. So that's why these pearls were so valuable. And this merchant, he wasn't just some regular jewelry store guy, store guy or didn't work the jewelry counter at Target or Walmart, that he, he was somebody that spent time traveling. It, the actual translation of the word that was used for merchant was emperos, which is a traveler. And so his whole livelihood was on obtaining and selling these pearls. So he was out there looking for the best, the best pearl he could find. And one day he came across it the best of the best. He found the one pearl that was perfect, that was bigger than the others, that was better shaped, more clear, no flaws, nothing wrong with it. He came across this pearl, and again, he recognized the value of this treasure, and he was willing to give up everything. So we have two parables here so far. We have one where a guy comes across something where he's not necessarily looking for it. He just happens across it. It's something that's hidden in plain sight. And he took everything he had, sold everything so that he could obtain it. Then we have number two, the guy who was searching for something of great value. He was looking for something. This, he was looking for the best of the best. And when he found it, he sold everything he, could have, he had so that he could have it. Now, I don't want you to extrapolate the wrong meaning from this stuff. This is a good time to point out that Jesus is not saying you can buy your salvation, give up everything and give all your money to the church. He's not saying that. You know, tithes and offerings are important. We do survive 
on the money that's given to the church by the congregation. I'm not giving you a tithing message right now. Because the kingdom of God is free to anyone who's willing to receive. You have to believe that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins on the cross and confess, like Romans 10, 9 says, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, or confess with your mouth, I'm sorry, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. So it's not about the money thing, but the point is the value. The kingdom of God has great value. More than anything else in this world, the kingdom of God has the value. While it's true we don't buy our way into the kingdom, we have to ask, do we re recognize the value? Do you truly recognize the value of the kingdom of God? Are you willing to become, or put up becoming a resident of the kingdom above everything else in this life, in this world? Or are we holding on to things? Holding on to things that might be holding us back or putting things above Jesus, above our relationship, above the pursuit of holiness. Are we putting our favorite sins? You don't need me to tell you what, you're, what you struggle with. Are we willing to surrender completely? Don't settle for lesser pearls. The things of the world, the things of the flesh, the desires that are keeping us from living as kingdom residents. Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, he gives his pedigree. He talks about, if you don't know Paul, he was that, he was, you know, the guy that wrote basically most of the New Testament. He, he was, if there was to be a hall of fame of spiritual giants, Paul would be like first one inducted, right? He was, he's the man, and he gave his pedigree, the things that he did, the, the, the way that he is, basically, anybody could possibly earn their way to salvation, he would have been able to do it, which he wasn't. But he talked about his accomplishments, his merits, his, his status, and in verses 7 through 11, he said, none of that matters. I'm going to read verses 7 through 11, but whatever were gained to me, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his suffering, to become like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. I wonder how many of us really think about our life, every, all, every other aspect in our life, compared to knowing Jesus, is compared to becoming like Jesus as rubbish, as garbage. Is getting to know Jesus and becoming more like him of the utmost importance above everything else to you? So there's just a few things that I'd like to share maybe for challenge you to think about here. First, the buried treasure took work. That guy in the field, he had to do something. He had to get busy and do something. He had to uncover the, the treasure. We need to do some work on our, our end. You know, some people say, I don't understand the Bible. I don't, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. It, and I get that. I was there. I, they say, God doesn't speak to me. But the thing they usually say is, how much are you really searching? Because I know how it was. I used to do it all the time. I'd be like, have my Bible. I'm 
screen for a second. And, you know, first of all, how much time are we making? How much time are we making for something of searching for buried treasures? Because I know how it is. Yeah, Lord, you know, I got about 15 minutes. Well, now probably 10 minutes by now. About 10 minutes, I'm ready. Speak to me. And half the time we're looking at our watch to see if we spent that 10 minutes. And then, you know, oh, I read, read this passage. I don't get it. And put it away. And the Bible goes back on the shelf for another, you know, until tomorrow. If we have time tomorrow. Or, you know, just, we read it. Nope. Done. And, you know, I've had Bibles my whole life. I, most of the time, they collect the dust during the week. You know, because I mean, that was before we could carry Bibles on our phone, which I love having that access on my phone. But I'd go to church on Sunday, and as soon as I got home, Bible would go on the shelf, you know, the specific Bible shelf, right? You know, you have that shelf where, because so, I don't want to lose my Bible, I want to be able to know where it is next Sunday, so it was right there, and it collects dust. It wasn't until I recognized the value. This is God's word to you and me. This is his love letter. He's revealing himself. He's revealing the kingdom through his word. That It wasn't until I recognized that that I realized the treasure. And then I began to, began to seek with diligence. I hungered for the word. I'm still hungering for the word. I'm, I'm not saying... You have to be in the Bible 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you, if, that, if you get that hunger, that's awesome. But how much time are we really devoting? How much time are we making to dig, to study, to pray, to listen to the Lord? Or are the idols of our lives getting more of our time? You know, I don't have, I don't have time to read my Bible as I'm on Facebook for eight hours a day, or streaming some dumb show. But I don't have time for the Bible, right? We need to consider the treasure that comes from hearing and reading and getting God's word fed to us. The world doesn't recognize the value of the kingdom of God, the treasure that's hidden in plain sight. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I want that power of God. The world will tell me that I'm brainwashed, that I'm crazy, that I'm nuts, that I'm giving up too much. Oh, you don't, you're going to lose your identity. You, all the Christianity is this, a bunch of rules that say you can't do this, can't do that, can't have any fun. Well, the, the merchant said no sacrifice was too great to in order to obtain the pearl. Jesus says that's what the kingdom is like. That's what the kingdom is like. It's a treasure that nothing is greater in this world. And in that first parable, Jesus said that he went with joy and sold everything he had. He didn't do it grudgingly. He didn't, oh, you know, the hoops I gotta jump through in order to get what I want. He didn't get mad. He, he didn't, wasn't discouraged. He didn't ha have emotional pain and fear. He had joy because he recognized what he was receiving was far greater. It was worth the temporary sacrifice to give up a little bit. We might have to give up some stuff in this world. Might not get that promotion. Might not get that job that you want. Might not get a spouse. Who knows what you might not get. But if it comes before God or leads you astray, it's not worth it. It's worth it to sacrifice anything, everything, in order to obtain the long-term wealth and security of the kingdom of heaven. Are you secure in the eternal future, in your future for the eternity? And another thought was the buried treasure it wasn't a coincidence. I saw a lot of, when I'm studying, I saw a lot of people say how he stumbled upon this treasure. He, he just stumbled upon it and, you know, it was there, like, by accident. I don't believe there's such a thing as coincidence. In the kingdom of God especially, there's no coincidence. 
God will put somebody in your path. God will put these things in your path, even if you're not searching, but at the right time, boom, there it is. You come across it. So, if we know God, here's, here's the thing that like rocked my world this week. If we know God, and we're in this world, we are potentially bearers of that treasure. We might be like the treasure chest or something. That this world comes across. Somebody in this world will come across at just the right time. And through us, the kingdom of God can be revealed. Through us, somebody can come to know the Lord and their eternal destiny be completely changed. Your life can reveal the kingdom. Someone comes across it at just the right time and they come to know Jesus. Think about that for a second. The interactions of this past week. What you did or who you dealt with or who you might or not have actually revealed the kingdom to this week because you showed them that you're just like the world. So it's a challenge this week to think about that. Your interactions, the people you come across, everything has the potential to either lead someone to or from the kingdom of God. But maybe you haven't, maybe this doesn't apply to you yet. Maybe you haven't found what you're looking for. You haven't come across that treasure or you're settling for cheap pearls, maybe made out of paste, Tasty pearls, junk, costume jewelry. You might even recognize the value. You've heard it before. You've been in church, you heard, you know, if I believe I'm saved and I can go to heaven. But there's just some things I'm not willing to give up yet. I'm not willing to commit. I've actually had conversations with people that said that have been in a message and when it was over said, you know, it all makes sense, and I get it, but I'm not ready to change it. What are you waiting for? <laughs> what are you waiting for? The, the, the world is not going to be here forever. I believe we're in the end times. What are you waiting for? Because it may be too late. Maybe that stuff that you're holding on to is keeping you from an eternity with Jesus. And I sure don't want that alternative. And I don't want that alternative for any of you because if you're not found in Christ, if you're not a new creation in Christ, your future is nothing but pain and suffering and eternal judgment for the sins that you've committed through your life. For rejection of Jesus. I've been in church my whole life. I looked for satisfaction in the world. I looked for satisfaction in substances to feel good, to get numb, to forget about everything. I looked for for satisfaction, I looked for treasure in love. Well, okay, maybe not love. Let's call it lust, like it actually is. I looked for for treasure and that stuff. But I wanted to be loved by people. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to fit in. <laughs> yeah. That never happened, by the way. <laughs> I've never fit anywhere, really. And I'm okay with that now. But my search for these things, for the search for the treasure, led me to a crossroads in my life. I came to a point where I had to choose. Because I tried everything. I sit sitting on, I've told you this before probably, but I've sat on the, uh, just, what do you call it? Sand dune, thank you. Sand dune of the beach, middle of the night, after smoking a pretty much a whole pack of cigarettes and, you know, having a few drinks and stuff, I'm sitting there crying and trying to decide, you know, I'm just so sick of this life of duplicity because I was going to church on Sundays. But I just went for fire insurance. I just went so that I could be spared hell. I, and it was 
fake. It wasn't real. And so I sat there and I'm, excuse me, I didn't mean. Thank you. Sitting there, trying to decide whether or not to just walk into the, to the lake, just keep walking until I cease to exist. Or if I was really going to have a change in my life. And I cried out to God. I said, Lord, if this is real, I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to give you a try. I'm, I'm all in. I chose, when I went to the crossroads, I chose the cross road. I followed the cross of Jesus. I found that precious pearl, and my life changed. I was willing to give up everything that I possessed as far as, you know, my comfort, my addictions, or my, you know, well, you know, all these different things. Let's not get into gory details of that. But I was willing to give it all up to become a kingdom resident. The rest of my life is devoted to hunting the treasures of Jesus and becoming more and more like him, to seek to become like Jesus. If you haven't made that decision, today is the day. Today is the day, now is the time. What are you waiting for? It's simple. All you have to do is talk to him. It doesn't have to be these exact, these exact words, but all you need to do is say, Lord, I get it, finally. I recognize the true value of the kingdom of heaven, that nothing is more valuable. So today I'm ready to let go of these things, to make you not just the one who saved me, but to make you the Lord of my life. And I dedicate my life to seeking you more and becoming more and more like you and pursuing holiness. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless y'all.